it's a real pleasure to talk to you all and thank you for showing interest because as a scientist who's been doing work for 20 years in the lab, it is nice to get what we're doing out there. When I moved across to Monash University after working at Melbourne for about 16 years, I was in a fortunate position to be at the receiving end of a generous donation that really believed in the kind of work that we were doing. And off the back of that, we, we were able to establish Brain Park where we look at the diagnostics differently, we look at the treatment differently, and we try to give a new experience and sort of change, give people another alternative option. When I first started the, the curiosity and looking at the brain, and it, it, it was started in the context of looking at people with psychosis and schizophrenia. And whenever we found something on the brain scans that was different to people who didn't have schizophrenia, we, we automatically assumed that, was, that they'd had that for the entirety of their life. Um, and so as time progressed and the years went on, then we started to see actually with things that have happened in the last 10 years or five years, there seems to be these brain correlates all the way through to then weeks. Um, you know, someone's feeling anxiety or depression over several weeks that we'd start to see brain correlates and, and some of them were anatomical. So when we think of addiction, I think a lot of people tend to uh, immediately go to alcohol and drugs. When we think about the prevalence rates of those conditions, we might see them about 4% for alcohol and 5% for drugs combined. But if we broaden the sort of a horizon and think about gamble, drink, consume, and all the behaviours that goes around them, the net is quite wide. And we're not quite sure even where the boundaries are between some of these things being a, a habit to an excessive habit to an addiction. And, and we're still trying to work all of those out. Collectively, then, there's a lot of physical, mental, brain health harms associated with these behaviours, and that's something that we have to deal with. If we stand back and look at the sort of the visual landscape of what addiction might or compulsions might look like, it's quite varied. It's very varied. People don't necessarily smoke a cigarette or a joint because they actually like that behaviour. There's, a, there's probably a something under that. There's a relief. There's a, a psychological, physical, not just a physical, but a psychological reason. If you have an alcohol problem and you stop taking alcohol, the underlying problem may not go away. You just stop taking alcohol. The way things run at the moment in terms of both research and clinically tends to be people come into either research or, or clinical services. You're assessed for whether you have an alcohol issue, you go to an alcohol research centre or an alcohol treatment, or if you have gambling, that's different. It's very much on the behavioural level that you get sort of triaged. The second problem, I think, is that while our current services and approaches are very helpful and everyone's doing the best they can. I think we sort of sometimes forget that maybe, particularly for the younger generation, that um, the environments that we and the way we try to engage them is not necessarily engaging or empowering. And finally, trying to get translate your work, the statistics say that it takes up to 17 years to, for a finding to hit actual translational value, and getting that work out there is very hard work. In 2013, I moved across to Monash, and at the time, Monash had a campaign that was, if you don't like it, change it, and that was perfect for me. Uh, David Winston Turner, who'd passed away the year before, had left a will in the area of compulsions and trying to really drive research capacity and I was on the fortunate end of receiving some of that and so I was able to begin a much more longer view on what impactful research could look like and um, sort of totally just ignored the academic outcomes for a while and just started to say what's the impact I'm looking for and it was an amazing opportunity. So just describe what Brain Park is. It's basically giving people mental experiences and physical experiences across lifestyle and technology capabilities, all of which are built around the idea that the brain is plastic and experiences, particularly high-intensity experiences and high-frequency experiences, do change the brain. And how can we use these to really change the brain in a, a good therapeutic way? If you take a cross-sectional snapshot of students in a university population and look at their anxiety and stress levels as a function of how engaged they are in exercise, you'll see a very strong correlation that the more active someone is, that the less mental health burden there is. 
That doesn't mean exercise, you know, fixes mental health. It's just an association, but it's a powerful one. I think for people who are on medication, maybe they can uh, take on these, you know, novel assessments and interventions in the hope of reducing their medication, maybe even coming off. I mean, for some people, clearly it's, it's necessary and you're not going to fix all the problems. I think the important thing is to just give people another option, one that they will engage with if it's not the current treatments, or one that they can engage with if it's not accessible or um, if it's not you know, too costly for them or just accessible in terms of geographic. In, in, in a preventative way, I think there's a lot of hope that if schools and businesses and you know can get on board with not having the intense craziness that currently exists but having these timeouts as part of work or around work where we do understand how you can do the physical uh, do the one hour of something that's good for you physically mentally socially etc as a real preventative for lots of these bad outcomes happening so i i think there's a lot of hope there and people are recognizing that that's more and more necessary and it actually gets the best out of their employees or their students and so on. Inactivity leads to a lot of problems. On the flip side, activity can be enhancing in many areas. The problem for us is a lot of this evidence, whether it's linked to inflammation or brain or cognition, etc., a lot of it comes from animal studies in idealistic controlled circumstances and doesn't always translate to human studies. So what we're doing really now that we've got the Brain Park facility is to be able to run these studies and look at how does exercise, if we change its intensity, its frequency, its duration, how do we hit stress and anxiety or decision making or brain health? Each of these are different outcomes and the mixture of these we, we think will lead to different outcomes here. For example, high intensity interval training it, where you really get the lactate system turning over seems to be more beneficial for brain health but it does cause a bit of stress whereas low intensity activity is better for stress and, but not for your brain health. And so depending on what outcome you want, we might be able to target a particular exercise prescription. There's principles of behaviour change that we're really trying to specialise in for so that these behaviours do actually last and endure. There's principles about how you know, habits and motivations work. Motivation gets you going but it doesn't sustain you and so how do you manipulate habits in a way to make sure it's not a decision every time to be you know effortful I have to exercise but you just make it a part of what you do by being clever around how you stack habits together or how you put triggers in there to make sure people do it and all the way to the beginning where you do motivational interviewing to make sure people understand why people why this is even good for them what is their understanding how does it help or hinder their life and you know, creating a bit of a dissonance early on, an understanding of, well, um, yeah, I should engage in this because this is what I want, this is where I am, and there's a conflict there, and this exercise might help me resolve that conflict because there's an outcome that I'm looking for. We're really aiming to be an external facing lab, so it's a really conscious decision where a lot of our outcomes, I'm really conscious not to leave it in the academic or even just the clinical, but we now partner with community partners, so a lot of our exercise stuff can go straight out into the community through particularly things like the YMCA, which have an international network. We're looking at the ethics and policy and commercial technology applications to really speed and scale all of this up. Having built Brain Park and now had six months to showcase it, the amount of interest and, and hunger, anywhere from business to medicine to community to technology, uh, internationally there, there is such a, a hunger for the way that the things come, you know, lifestyle and technology can come together for good. It's, um, I'm, I'm sort of inspired to keep going.